Chapter Twelve of Historical Tales, Volume Eight, Russian, by Charles Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve, The Macbeth of Russia. On the fifteenth of May, fifteen ninety one, five boys were playing in the courtyard of the Russian palace at Uglitch. With them were the governess and nurse of the principal child, a boy ten years of age, and a servant woman. The child had a knife in his hand, with which he was amusing himself by thrusting it into the ground or cutting a piece of wood. Unluckily, the attention of the women, for a brief interval, was drawn aside. When the nurse looked at her charge again, to her horror, she found him writhing on the ground, bathed in blood which poured from a large wound in his throat. The shrieks of the nurse quickly drew others to the spot, and in a moment there was a terrible uproar, for the dying boy was no less a person than Dmitri, son of Ivan the Terrible, brother of Feodor, the reigning Tsar, and heir to the crown of Russia. The tocsin was sounded, and the populace thronged into the courtyard, thinking that the palace was on fire. On learning what had actually happened, they burst into uncontrollable fury. The child had not killed himself, but had been murdered, they said, and a victim for their rage was sought. In a moment the governess was hurled bleeding and half alive to the ground, and one of her slaves who came to her aid was killed. The keeper of the palace was accused of the crime, and though he fled and barred himself within a house, the infuriated mob broke through the doors and killed him and his son. The body of the child was carried into a neighboring church, and here the son of the governess, against whom suspicion had been directed, was murdered before it under his mother's eyes. Fresh victims to the wrath of the populace were sought, and the lives of the governess and some others were with difficulty saved. As for the child who had killed himself or had been killed, alarming stories had recently been set afloat. He was said to be the image of his terrible father, and to manifest an unnatural delight in blood and the sight of pain, his favorite amusement being to torture and kill animals. But it is doubtful if any of this was true, for there was then one in power who had a reason for arousing popular prejudice against the boy. That this may be better understood we must go back. Ivan had killed his ablest son, as told in a previous story, and Feodor, the present Tsar, was a feeble, timid, sickly incapable, who was a mere tool in the hands of his ambitious minister, Boris Gudinov. Boris craved the throne. Between him and this lofty goal lay only the feeble feeder and the child Dmitri, the sole direct survivors of the dynasty of Rurik. With their death, without children, that great line would be extinguished. The story of Boris reminds us in several particulars of that of the Scotch usurper Macbeth. His future career had been predicted in the dead of night by astrologers who said, You shall yet wear the crown. Then they became silent as if seeing horrors which they dared not reveal. Boris insisted on knowing more, and was told that he should reign, but only for seven years. In joy, he exclaimed, no matter, though it be for only seven days, so that I reign. This ambitious lord, who ruled already if he did not reign, had therefore a purpose in exciting prejudice against, and distrust of, Dmitri, the only heir to the crown, and in taking steps for his removal. Feodor dead, the throne would fall like ripe fruit into his own hands. Yet, whether guilty of the murder or not, he took active steps to clear himself of the dark suspicion of guilt. An inquest was held, and the verdict rendered that the boy had killed himself by accident. At once the regent proceeded to punish those who had taken part in the outbreak at Uglitch. The Tsaritsa, mother of Dmitri, who had first incited the mob, was forced to take the veil. Her brothers, who had declared the act one of murder, were sent to remote prisons. Uglitch was treated with frightful severity. More than two hundred of its inhabitants were put to death. Others were maimed and thrown into dungeons. All the rest, except those who had fled, were exiled to Siberia, and with them was banished the very church bell which had called them out by its toxin peal. A town of thirty thousand inhabitants was depopulated, that, as people said, every evidence of the guilt of Boris Gudinov might be destroyed. This dreadful violence did Boris more harm than good. Macbeth stabbed the sleeping grooms to hide his guilt. Boris destroyed a city. But he only caused the people to look on him as an assassin and to doubt the motives of even his noblest acts. A fierce fire broke out that left much of Moscow in ruin. 
Boris rebuilt whole streets and distributed money freely among the people. But even those who received this aid said that he had set fire to the city himself, that he might win applause with his money. A Tartar army invaded the empire and appeared at the gates of Moscow. All were in terror but Boris, who hastily built redoubts, recruited soldiers, and inspired all with his own courage. The Tartars were defeated, and hardly a third of them reached home again. Yet all the return the able regent received was the popular saying that he had called in the Tartars in order to make the people forget the death of Dmitri. A child was born to Feodor, a girl. The enemies of the regent instantly declared that a boy had been born, and that he had substituted it for a girl. It died in a few days, and then it was said that he had poisoned it. Yet Boris went on, disdaining his enemies, winning power as he went. He gained the favor of the clergy by giving Russia a patriarch of its own. The nobles who opposed him were banished or crushed. He made the peasants slaves of the land, and thus won over the petty lords. Cities were built, fortresses erected, and the enemies of Russia defeated. Siberia was brought under firm control, and the whole nation made to see that it had never been ruled by abler hands. Boris, in all this, was strongly paving his way to the throne. In 1598 the weak Feodor died. He left no sons, and with him its fifty-second sovereign, the dynasty of Rurik the Varangian, came to an end. It had existed for more than seven centuries. Branches of the house of Rurik remained, yet no member of it dared aspire to that throne which the tyrant Ivan had made odious. A new ruler had to be chosen by the voice of those in power, and Boris stood supreme among the aspirants. The chronicles tell us, with striking brevity, the election begins, the people look up to the nobles, the nobles to the grandees, the grandees to the patriarch. He speaks, he names Boris, and instantaneously, and as one man, all re-echo that formidable name. And now Godunov played an amusing game. He held the reins of power so firmly that he could safely enact a transparent farce. He refused the scepter. The grandees and the people begged him to accept it, and he took refuge from their solicitations in a monastery. This comedy, which even Caesar had not long played, Boris kept up for over a month. Yet from his cell he moved Russia at his will. In truth, the more he seemed to withdraw, the more eager became all to make him accept. Priests, nobles, people, besieged him with their supplications. He refused, and again refused, and for six weeks kept all Russia in suspense. Not until he saw before him the highest grandees and clergy of the realm on their knees, tears in their eyes, in their hands the relics of the saints and the image of the Redeemer, did he yield what seemed a reluctant assent and come forth from his cell to accept that throne which was the chief object of his desires. But Boris on the throne still resembled Macbeth. The memory of his crimes pursued him, and he sought to rule by fear instead of love. He endeavoured, indeed, to win the people by shows and prodigality, but the powerful he ruled with a heavy hand, destroying all whom he had reason to fear, threatening the extinction of many great families by forbidding their members to marry, seizing the wealth of those he had ruined. The family of the Romanovs, allied to the line of Rurik, and soon to become preeminent in Russia, he pursued with rancor, its chief being obliged to turn monk to escape the axe. As monk he in time rose to the headship of the church. The peasantry, who had before possessed liberty of movement, were by him bound as serfs to the soil. Thousands of them fled, and an insupportable inquisition was established, as hateful to the landowners as to the serfs. All this was made worse by famine and pestilence, which ravaged Russia for three years. And in the midst of this disaster the ghost of the slain Dmitri rose to plague his murderer. In other words, one who claimed to be the slain prince appeared and avenged the murdered child, his story forming one of the most interesting tales in the history of Russia. It is this which we have now to tell. About midsummer of the year 1603, Adam Wisniewicki, a Polish prince, angry at some act of negligence in a young man whom he had lately employed, gave him a box on the ear and called him by an insulting name. "'If you knew who I am, prince,' said the indignant youth, "'you would not strike me, nor call me by such a name. "'Knew who you are? Why, who are you? "'I am Dmitri, son of Ivan the Fourth, and rightful Tsar of Russia.' surprised by this extraordinary statement, the prince questioned him, and was told a plausible story by the young man. 
He had escaped the murderer, he said, the boy who died being the son of a serf who resembled and had been substituted for him by his physician Simon, who knew what Boris designed. The physician had fled with him from Uglitch and put him in the hands of a loyal gentleman who for safety had consigned him to a monastery. The physician and gentleman were both dead, but the young man showed the prince a Russian seal which bore Dmitri's arms and name, and a gold cross adorned with jewels of great value, given him, he said, by his princely godfather. He was about the age which Dmitri would have reached, and as a Russian servant who had seen the child said, had warts and other marks like those of the true Dmitri. He possessed also a persuasiveness of manner which soon won over the Polish prince. The pretender was accepted as an illustrious guest by Prince Wisniewicki, given clothes, horses, carriages, and a suitable retinue, and presented to other Polish dignitaries. Dmitri, as he was thenceforth known, bore well the honours now showered upon him. He was at ease amongst the noblest, gracious, affable, but always dignified, and all said that he had the deportment of a prince. He spoke Polish as well as Russian, was thoroughly versed in Russian history and genealogy, and was, moreover, an accomplished horseman, versed in field sports and of striking vigour and agility, qualities highly esteemed by the Polish nobles. The story of this event quickly reached Russia, and made its way with surprising rapidity through all the provinces. The Tsarevich Dmitri had not been murdered after all. He was alive in Poland, and was about to call the usurper to a terrible reckoning. The whole nation was astir with the story, and various accounts of his having been seen in Russia, and of having played a brave part in the military expeditions of the Cossacks, were set afloat. Boris soon heard of this claimant of the throne. He also received the disturbing news that a monk was among the Cossacks of the Don, urging them to take up arms for the Tsarevich, who would soon be among them. His first movement was the injudicious one of trying to bribe Viznovitsky to give up the impostor to him, the result being to confirm the belief that he was in truth the prince he claimed to be. The events that followed are too numerous to be given in detail, and it must suffice here to say that on October 31, 1604, Dmitri entered Russian territory at the head of a small Polish army of less than five thousand in all. This was a trifling force with which to invade an empire, but it grew rapidly as he advanced. Town after town submitted on his appearance, bringing to him bound and gagged the governors set over them by Boris. Dmitri at once set them free and treated them with polite humanity. The first town to offer resistance was Novgorod Sversky, which Peter Basmanov, a general of Boris, had garrisoned with five hundred men. Basmanov was brave and obstinate, and for several weeks he held the force of Dmitri before this petty place, while Boris was making vigorous efforts to collect an army among his discontented people. On the last day of 1604 the two armies met, fifteen thousand against fifty thousand, and on a broad open plain that gave the weaker force no advantage of position. But Dmitri made up for weakness by soldierly spirit. At the head of some six hundred mail-clad Polish knights, he vigorously charged the Russian right wing, hurled it back upon the centre, and soon had the whole army in disorder. The soldiers flung down their arms and fled, shouting, The Tsarevich! The Tsarevich! Yet in less than a month this important victory was followed by a defeat. Dmitri had been weakened by his Poles being called home. Boris gathered new forces, and on January twentieth, 1605, the armies met again now seventy thousand Muscovites, against less than a quarter their number. Yet victory would have come to Dmitri again, but for treachery in his army. He charged the enemy with the same fierceness as before, bore down all before him, routed the cavalry, tore a great gap in the line of the infantry, and would have swept the field, had the main body of his army, consisting of eight thousand Zaporogs, come to his aid. At this vital moment, this great body of cavalry, half the entire army, wheeled and quit the field, bribed, it is said, by Boris. Such a defection, at such a moment, was fatal. The Russians rallied, the day was lost, nothing but flight remained. Dmitri fled, hotly pursued, and his horse suffering from a wound. He was saved by his devoted Cossack infantry, four thousand in number, who stood to their guns and faced the whole Muscovite army. They were killed to a man, but Dmitri escaped favoured, as we are told, by some of the opposing leaders who did not want to make Boris too powerful. All was not lost, while Dmitri remained at liberty. Lost armies could be restored. He took refuge in Putivle, 
one of the towns which had pronounced in his favour, and while his enemies, who proved half-hearted in the cause of Boris, wasted their time in besieging a small fortress, new adherents flocked to his banner. Boris was furious against his generals, but his fury caused them to hate instead of to serve him. He tried to get rid of Dmitri by poison, but his agents were discovered and punished, and the attempt helped his rival more than a victory would have done. Dmitri wrote to Boris, declaring that heaven had protected him against this base attempt, and, ironically, promising to extend mercy towards him. "'Descend from the throne you have usurped, and seek in the solitude of the cloister to reconcile yourself with heaven. In that case I will forget your crimes, and even assure you of my sovereign protection.' All this was bitter to the Russian Macbeth. The princely blood which he had shed to gain the throne seemed to redden the air about him. The ghost of his slain victim haunted him. His power, indeed, seemed as great as ever. He was an autocrat still, the master of a splendid court, the ruler over a vast empire. Yet he knew that they who came with reverence and adulation into his presence hated him in their hearts, and anguish must have smitten the usurper to the soul. His sudden death seems to indicate this. On the 13th of April, 1605, after dining in state with some distinguished foreigners, illness suddenly seized him, blood burst from his mouth, nose, and ears, and within two hours he was dead. He had reigned six years, nearly the full term predicted by the soothsayers. The story of Dmitri is a long one still, but must be dealt with here with the greatest brevity. Theodore, the son of Boris, was proclaimed Tsar by the boyars of the court. The oath of allegiance was taken by the whole city. All seemed to favour him, yet within six weeks this boyish Tsar was deposed and executed without a sword being drawn in his defence. Basmanov, the leading general of Boris, had turned to the cause of Dmitri, and the army seconded him. The people of Moscow declared in favour of the pretender. There were a few executions and banishments, and on the 20th of June the new Tsar entered Moscow in great pomp, amid the acclamations of an immense multitude who thronged the streets, the windows, and the housetops and the young man who, less than two years before, had had his ears boxed by a Polish prince, was now proclaimed emperor and autocrat of the mighty Russian realm. It was a short reign to which the false Dmitri, for there seems to be no doubt of the death of the true Dmitri, had come. Within less than a year Moscow was in rebellion, he was slain, and the throne was vacant. And this result was largely due to his generous and kindly spirit, largely to his trusting nature and disregard of Russian opinion. No man could have been more unlike the tyrant Ivan, his reputed father. Dmitri proved kind and generous to all, even bestowing honours upon members of the family of Godunov. He remitted heavy taxes, punished unjust judges, paid the debts contracted by Ivan, passed laws in the interest of the serfs, and held himself ready to receive the petitions and redress the grievances of the humblest of his subjects. His knowledge of state affairs was remarkable for one of his age, and Russia had never had an abler, nobler-minded, and more kindly-hearted Tsar. But Dmitri in discretion was still a boy, and made trouble where an older head would have mended it. He offended the boyars out of his council by laughing at their ignorance. "'Go and travel,' he said. "'Observe the ways of civilized nations, for you are no better than savages.' The advice was good, but not wise." He offended the Russian demand for decorum in a czar by riding through the streets on a furious stallion like a Cossack of the dawn. In religion he was lax, favouring secretly the Latin church. He chose Poles instead of Russians for his secretaries, and he excited general disgust by the announcement that he was about to marry a Polish woman, heretical to the Russian faith. The people were still more incensed by the conduct of Marina, this foreign bride, both before and after the wedding she giving continual offence by her insistence on Polish customs. While thus offending the prejudices and superstitions of his people, Dmitri prepared for his downfall by his trustfulness and clemency. He dismissed the spies with whom former czars had surrounded themselves, and laid himself freely open to treachery. The result of his acts and his openness was a conspiracy which was fortunately discovered. Shuiski, its leader, was condemned to be executed. Yet as he knelt with the axe lifted above him, he was respited and banished to Siberia, and on his way thither a courier overtook him, bearing a pardon for him and his banished brothers. His rank was restored, and he was again made a counsellor of the empire. Clemency like this was praiseworthy, but it proved fatal, 
Like Caesar before him, Dmitri was over-clement and over-confident, and with the same result. Yet his answer to those who urged him to punish the conspirator was a noble one, and his trustfulness worth far more than a security due to cruelty and suspicion. No, he said, I have sworn not to shed Christian blood, and I will keep my oath. There are two ways of governing an empire, tyranny and generosity. I choose the latter. I will not be a tyrant. I will not spare money. I will scatter it on all hands. Only for the offence which he gave his people by disregarding their prejudices, Dmitri might have long and ably reigned. His confidence opened the way to a new conspiracy, of which Shuisky was again at the head. Reports were spread through the city that Dmitri was a heretic and an impostor, and that he had formed a plot to massacre the Muscovites by the aid of the Poles whom he had introduced into the city. As a result of the insidious methods of the conspirators, the whole city broke out in rebellion, and at daybreak on the twenty ninth of May, 1606, a body of boyars gathered in the great square in full armor, and followed by a multitude of townsmen, advanced on the Kremlin, whose gates were thrown open by traitors within. Dmitri, who had only fifty guards in the palace, was aroused by the din of bells and the uproar in the streets. An armed multitude filled the outer court, shouting, Death to the impostor! Soon conspirators appeared in the palace, where the Tsar, snatching a sword from one of the guards and attended by Basmanov, attacked them, crying out, I am not a Boris for you. He killed several with his own hands, but Basmanov was slain before him, and he and the guards were driven back from chamber to chamber, until the guards, finding that the Tsar had disappeared, laid down their arms. Dmitri, seeing that resistance was hopeless, had sought a distant room, and here had leaped or been thrown from a window to the ground. The height was thirty feet, his leg was broken by the fall, and he fainted with the pain. His last hope of life was gone. Some faithful soldiers who found him sought to defend him against the mob who soon appeared, but their resistance was of no avail. Dmitri was seized, his royal garments were torn off, and the caftan of a pastry-cook was placed upon him. Thus dressed, he was carried into a room of the palace for the mockery of a trial. "'Bastard dog!' cried one of the Russians. "'Tell us who you are and whence you came.' "'You all know. I am your Tsar,' replied Dmitri bravely, "'the legitimate son of Ivan Vasilievich. "'If you desire my death, give me time at least to collect my senses.' At this, a Russian gentleman named Valnif shouted out, "'What is the use of so much talk with the heretic dog? This is the way I confess this Polish fifer.' And he put an end to the agony of Dmitri by shooting him through the breast. In an instant, the mob rushed on the lifeless body, slashing it with axes and swords. It was carried out, placed on a table, and a set of bagpipes set on the breast with the pipe in the mouth. "'You played on us long enough. Now play for us,' cried the ribald insulter." Others lashed the corpse with their whips, crying, "'Look at the Tsar, the hero of the Germans!' For three days Dmitri's body lay exposed to the view of the populace, but it was so hacked and mangled that none could recognize in it the gallant young man who a few days before had worn the imperial robes and crown. On the third night a blue flame was seen playing over the table, and the guards, frightened by this natural result of putrefaction, hastened to bury the body outside the walls." but superstitious terrors followed the prodigy. It was whispered that Dmitri was a wizard, who by magic arts had the power to come to life from the grave. To prevent this, the body was dug up again and burned, and the ashes were collected, mixed with gunpowder, and rammed into a cannon, which was then dragged to the gate by which Dmitri had entered Moscow. Here the match was applied, and the ashes of the late Tsar were hurled down the road leading to Poland, whence he had come. Thus died a man who— impostor though he seems to have been, was perhaps the noblest and best of all the Russian Tsars, while the story of his rise and fall forms the most dramatic tale in all the annals of the empire over which for one short year he ruled. End of chapter 12《ラッシュの歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴
they fell like seeds of war on the soil of russia and for years that unhappy land was torn by faction and harried by invasion from those ashes new dmitris seemed to spring other impostors rose to claim the crown and until all these shades were laid peace fled from the land vasily shuisky the leader in the insurrection against dmitri had himself proclaimed czar he was destined to learn the truth of the saying uneasy lies the head that wears the crown for hardly had the mob that murdered dmitri dispersed before rumors arose that their victim was not dead his body had been so mangled that none could recognize it and the story was set afloat that it was one of his officers who had been killed and that he had escaped four swift horses were missing from the stables of the palace and these were at once connected with the assumed flight of the czar rumor was in the air and even in moscow doubts of dmitri's death grew rife fuel soon fell on the flame three strangers in russian dress but speaking the language of poland crossed the oka river and gave the ferryman the high fee of six ducats you have ferried the czar when he comes back to moscow with a polish army he will not forget your service at a german inn a little farther on the same party used similar language this story spread like wildfire through russia and deeply alarmed the new czar to put it down he sought to play on the religious feelings of the russians by making a saint of the original dmitri a body was produced said to have been taken from the grave of the slain boy at uglitch but in a remarkable state of preservation since it still displayed the fresh hue of life and held in its hand some strangely preserved nuts tales of miracles performed by the relics of the new saint were also spread but with little avail for the people were not very ready to believe the man who had stolen the throne War broke out despite these manufactured miracles. Prince Shachovsky, the supposed leader of the party who had told the story at the Oka, was soon in the field with an army of Cossacks and peasants, and defeated the royal army. But the new Dmitri, in whose name he fought, did not appear. It seemed as if Shachovsky had not yet been able to find a suitable person to play the part. Russia, however, was not long without a pretender. During Dmitri's reign a young man had appeared among the Cossacks of the Volga, calling himself Peter Feodorovich, and claiming to be the son of the former Tsar Feodor. This man now reappeared and presented himself to the rebel army as the representative of his uncle Dmitri. He was eagerly welcomed by Shachovsky, who badly needed someone whom he might offer to his men as a prince. And now we have to describe one of the strangest sieges of the annals of history shachovsky finding himself threatened by a powerful army took refuge in the fortified town of toula here he was soon joined by bolotnikov a polish general who had come to russia with a commission bearing the imperial seal of dmitri in this stronghold they were besieged by an army of one hundred thousand men led by the czar himself toula was strong it was vigorously defended the garrison fighting bravely for their lives no progress was made with the siege, and Shuisky grew disconsolate, for he knew that to fail now would be ruin. From this state of anxiety he was relieved by a remarkable proposal, that of an obscure individual who promised to drown all the people of Tola and deliver the town into his hands. This extraordinary offer, made by a monk named Kravkov, was at first received with incredulous laughter, and it was some time before the Tsar and his council could be brought to listen to the words of an idle braggart, as they deemed the stranger. In the end, the Tsar asked him to explain his plan. It proved to be the following. Tula lay in a little narrow valley, down whose centre flowed the little river Upa, passing through the town. Kravkov suggested that they should dam this stream below the town, do as I say, he remarked, and if the whole town is not under water in a few hours, I will answer for the failure with my head. The project thus presented seemed feasible. Immediately all the millers in the army, men used to the kind of work required, were put under his orders, and the other soldiers were set to carrying sacks of earth to the place chosen for the dam. As this rose in height, the water backed up in the town. Soon many of the streets became canals, hundreds of houses undermined by the water were destroyed, and the promise of Kravkov seemed likely to be fulfilled. Yet the garrison, confined in what had become a walled-in lake, fought with desperate obstinacy. Water surrounded them, yet they waded to the walls and fought. Famine decimated them, yet they starved and fought. A terrible epidemic broke out in the water-soaked city, but the garrison fought on. Dreadful as were their surroundings, they held out with unflinching courage and intrepidity. The dam was the centre of the struggle. 
the besiegers sought to raise it still higher and deepen the water in the streets the besieged did their best to break it down and relieve the city it had grown to a great height with such rapidity that the superstitious people of tula felt sure that magic had aided its building and fancied that it might be destroyed by magic means a monk declared that chuiski had brought devils to his aid but professed to be a proficient in the black art and offered for a hundred roubles to fight the demons in their own element bolotnikov accepted his terms and he stripped plunged into the river and disappeared for a full hour nothing was seen of him and every one gave him up for lost but at the end of that time he rose to the surface of the water his body covered with scratches the story he had to tell was to say the least remarkable i have had a frightful conflict he said with the twelve thousand devils shuiski has at work upon his dam i have settled six thousand of them but the other six thousand are the worst of all and will not give in thus against men and devils alike against water famine and pestilence fought the brave men of tula holding out with extraordinary courage letters came to them in dmitri's name promising help but it never came at length after months of this brave defence had elapsed shakovsky proposed that they should capitulate the cossacks of the garrison furious at the suggestion seized and thrust him into a dungeon not until every scrap of food had been eaten horses and dogs devoured even leather gnawed as food did bolotnikov and peter the pretender offer to yield and then only on condition that the soldiers should receive honourable treatment if not they would die with arms in their hands and devour one another as food rather than surrender as for themselves they asked for no pledges of safety shuiski accepted the terms and the gates were opened bolotnikov advanced boldly to the czar and offered himself as a victim presenting his sword with the edge laid against his neck i have kept the oath i swore to him who rightly or wrongly calls himself dmitri he said deserted by him i am in your power cut off my head if you will or if you will spare my life i will serve you as i have served him this appeal was wasted on shuiski he forgot the clemency which the czar dmitri had formerly shown to him sent bolotnikov to kargopol and soon after ordered him to be drowned peter the pretender was hanged on the spot shachowski alone was spared they found him in chains which he said had been placed on him because he counselled the obstinate rebels to submit Shuiski set him free, and the first use he made of his liberty was to kindle the rebellion again. Thus ended this remarkable siege, one in some respects without parallel in the history of war. What followed must be briefly told. Though the siege of Tula ended with the hanging of one pretender to the throne, another was already in the field. The new Dmitri, in whose name the war was waged, had made his appearance during the siege some of the officers of the first dmitri pretended to recognize him but in reality he was a coarse vulgar ignorant knave who had badly learned his lesson and lacked all the native princeliness of his predecessor yet he had soon a large army at his back and with it on april twenty fourth sixteen o eight he defeated the army of the czar with great slaughter he might easily have taken moscow but instead of advancing on it he halted at the village of tushino twelve versts away where he held his court for seventeen months meanwhile still another pretender appeared who called himself feodor son of the czar feodor he presented himself to the don cossacks who brought him in chains to dmitri by whom he was promptly put to death soon afterwards marina wife of the first dmitri who had been released with her father by shuiski was brought into the camp of the pretender and here an interesting bit of comedy was played marina rather than go back to meet ridicule in poland was ready to become the wife of this vulgar impostor though she saw at once that he was not the man he claimed to be she met him coldly at first but at a second meeting she greeted him with a great show of tenderness before the whole army being glad it would appear to regain her old position on any terms the news that marina had recognized the pretender brought over numbers to his side and soon nearly all russia had declared for him the only cities holding out being moscow novgorod and smolensk the false dmitri had now reached the summit of his fortunes a rapid decline followed one of his generals who laid siege to the monastery of the trinity near moscow was repulsed his partisans were defeated in other quarters soon the whole aspect of the war changed a new enemy to russia came into the field sigismund king of poland who laid siege to the strong city of smolensk while the army of the czar which marched to its relief suffered an annihilating defeat 
This result closed the reign of Shuiski. An insurrection broke out in Moscow. He was forced to become a monk, and in the end was delivered to Sigismund and died in prison. Thus was Dmitri avenged. The new condition of affairs proved as disastrous to the false Dmitri. His poles deserted him, his power vanished, and he descended to the level of a mere Cossack robber. In December 1610, murder ended his career. Smolensk fell after a siege of eighteen months. But at the last moment a powder magazine exploded and set fire to the city, and Sigismund became master only of a heap of ruins. The Poles in Moscow, attacked by the Russians, took possession of the Kremlin, burned down most of the city, and massacred a hundred thousand of the people. Anarchy was rampant everywhere. New chiefs appeared in all quarters. Each town declared for itself. The Swedes took possession of Novgorod. A third Dmitri appeared and dwelt in state for a while, but was soon taken and hanged. The whole great empire was in a state of frightful confusion, and seemed as if it was about to fall to pieces. From this fate it was saved by one of the common people, a butcher of Nizhny Novgorod, Kozma Minin by name. Brave, honest, patriotic, and sensible, this man aroused his fellow citizens, who took up arms for the deliverance of their country. Other towns followed this example. An army was raised with Prince Poyarsky at its head, and Minin, the patriotic butcher, seconded him in an administrative capacity, being hailed by the people as the elect of the whole Russian Empire. Driving the Poles before him, Poyarsky entered Moscow, and in October 1612 became master of the Kremlin. The impostors all disappeared. Marina and her three-year-old son Ivan were captured, the child to be hanged, and she to end her eventful life in prison. Anarchy vanished, and peace returned to the realm. The end came in 1613, when a national council was convened to choose a new czar. Poyarsky refused the crown, and Michael Romanov, a boy of sixteen, scion of one of the noblest families of Russia, and allied to the Ruriks by the female line, was elected czar. His descendants still hold the throne. End of chapter 13《ラッシュ・ストリート・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャーナル・ジャー and in these were set down not only the genealogies of the families but every office that had been held by any ancestor at court in the army or in the administration with this there is no special fault to be found it is as well doubtless to keep the pedigrees of men as it is to keep those of horses and dogs though the animals being ignorant of their records are less likely to make them a matter of pride and presumption in Russia, the fact that certain men knew the names and standing of their ancestors led to the most absurd consequences. The books of ancestry were constantly appealed to for the support of foolish pretensions, and the nobles of Russia strutted like so many peacocks in their insensate pride of family. In no other country has the question of precedence been carried to such ridiculous lengths as it was in Russia in the days of the early Romanovs. If a nobleman were appointed to a post at court, or a position in the army, he at once examined the books of ancestry to learn if the officials under whom he would serve had fewer ancestors on record than he. If such proved to be the case, the office was refused, or accepted under protest, the government being, metaphorically, forced to fall on its knees to the haughtiness of its offended lordling. The folly of the nobles went even farther than this. The height of their genealogy counted for as much as its length they would refuse to accept positions under persons whose ancestors were shown by the books to have been subordinate to theirs in the same positions. If it appeared that the John of five centuries before had been under the Peter of that period, the modern Peter was too proud to accept a similar position under the modern John. And so it went until court life became a constant scene of bickering and discontent, and of murmurs of the most trifling slights and neglects. In short, it became necessary that an office of genealogy should be established at court, in which exact copies of the family trees and service registers of the noble families were kept, and the officers here employed found enough to keep them busy in settling the endless disputes of their lordly clients. End of 
in the reign of Theodore, the third Tsar of the Romanov dynasty. This ridiculous sentiment reached its climax, and it became almost impossible to appoint a wise man to office over a fool, if the fool's ancestors had happened to hold the same office over those of the man of wisdom. The fancy seemed to be held that folly and wisdom are handed down from father to son, a conceit which is often the very reverse of the truth. Theodore was a feeble youth, who reigned little more than five years, yet in that time he managed to bury this folly out of sight. Annoyed by the constant bickerings of courtiers and officials, he consulted with his able minister, Prince Vasily Galitsyn, and hit on a means of ridding himself of the difficulty. Proclamation was made that all the noble families of the kingdom should deliver their service rolls into court by a fixed date, that they might be cleared of certain errors which had unavoidably crept into them. The order was obeyed, and a multitude of these precious documents were brought into the palace halls of the Tsar. The heads of the noble families and the higher clergy were now sent for, composing a proud assembly, before whom the patriarch, who had received his instructions, made an eloquent address. He ended by speaking of the claims to precedence in the following words. They are a bitter source of every kind of evil. They render abortive the most useful enterprises, in like manner, as the tares stifle the good grain. They have introduced even into the hearts of families dissension, confusion, and hatred. But the pontiff comprehends the grand design of his czar. God alone could have inspired it. Though utterly ignorant of what that design was, the grandees felt compelled to express a warm approval of these words. At this, Theodore, who pretended to be enraptured by their applause, suddenly rose, and simulating a burst of patriotic enthusiasm, proclaimed the abolition of all their hereditary claims. "'That the very collection of them may be for ever extinguished,' he exclaimed, "'let all the papers relative to these titles be instantly consumed.' The fire was already prepared, and by his orders the precious papers were hurled into the flames before the anguished eyes of the nobles, who did not dare in that despotic court to express their true feelings, and strove to hide their dismay under hollow acclamations of assent. As what they deemed their most valuable possessions were thus converted to ashes before their eyes, the patriarch rose again and declared an anathema against any one who should dare to oppose this order of the Tsar. An amen that was like a groan came from the lips of the horrified nobles, and precedence went up in flames. The Tsar had no thought of effacing the noble families. New books were prepared in which their ancestry was described, but the absurd claims which had caused such discord were forever abolished, and court life thereafter proved smoother and easier in consequence of the iconoclastic act of the Tsar Theodore. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris. Chapter 15 Boyhood of Peter the Great. Peter the Great, grandson of the first emperor of the Romanov line, was a man of such extraordinary power of body and mind, such a remarkable combination of common sense, mental activity, advanced ideas, and determination to lift Russia to a high place among the nations, with cruelty, grossness, and infirmities of vice and passion, that his reign of forty-three years fills as large a place in Russian history as do the annals of all the preceding centuries, and the progress of Russia during this short period was greater than in any other epoch of three or four times its length. The character of the man showed in the boy, and while a mere child he began those steps of progress which were continued throughout his life. He had two brothers, both older than he, and sons of a different mother, so that the throne seemed far from his grasp. But Theodore, the oldest of the three, died after a brief reign, leaving no heirs to the throne. Ivan, the second son, was an imbecile, nearly blind and subject to epileptic fits. The clergy and grandees, in consequence, looked upon Peter as the most promising successor to the throne, but he was still only a child, not yet ten years of age. The Tsar Alexis had left also several daughters, but in those days the fate of princesses of the blood was a harsh one. They were not permitted to marry, and were consigned to convents, where they knew nothing of what was passing in the busy world without.' 
One of the daughters, Sophia by name, had escaped this fate. At her earnest request she was taken from the convent and permitted to nurse her sickly brother Theodore. She was a woman of high intelligence, bold and ambitious by nature, and during her residence in court learned much of the politics of the empire, and took some part in its government. After the death of Theodore she contrived to have herself named regent for her two brothers, Ivan being plainly unfit to rule, and Peter too young. There are many stories told about her, of which probably the half are not true. It is said that she kept her young brother at a distance from Moscow, where she surrounded him with ministers of evil, whose business it was to encourage him in riot and dissipation, to the end that he might become a moral monster, odious and insupportable to the nation at large. Such a course had been pursued with Ivan the Terrible, and to it was largely due his incredible iniquity. If Sophia had really any such purpose in view, she was playing with edge-tools. She quite mistook the character of her young brother, and forgot that the same rule may work differently in different cases. The steps taken to make the boy base, if really so intended, aided to make him great. His morals were corrupted, his health was impaired, and his heart hardened by the excesses of his youth, but his removal from the palace atmosphere of flattery and effeminacy tended to make him self-reliant, while his free life in the country and the activity which it encouraged helped to develop the native energy of his character. It is probable that Sophia had no such intention to corrupt the nature of the child, for she showed no ill-will against him. It was apparently to his mother, rather than to his sister, that his residence in the country was due, and he was obliged to go frequently to Moscow to take part in ceremonial affairs, while his name was used in all public documents, many of which he was required to sign. From early life the boy had shown himself active, intelligent, quick to learn, and full of curiosity. He was particularly interested in military affairs, and playing at soldiers was one of the leading diversions of his youth. Only a day or two after a great riot in Moscow, in which numbers of nobles were slaughtered, and in which the child had looked unmoved into the savage faces of the rioters, he sent to the arsenal for drums, banners, and arms. Uniforms and wooden cannon were supplied him, and on his eleventh birthday, in 1683, he was allowed to have some real guns, with which he fired salutes. From his country home at Preobrayensk, messengers came almost daily to Moscow for powder, lead, and shot. Small brass and iron cannon were supplied the boy, and drummer boys selected from the different regiments were sent to him. Thus he was allowed to play at soldier to his heart's content. A company was formed from the younger domestics of the palace, fifty in number, the officers being sons of the boyars or lords. But these were required by the alert boy to pass through all the grades of the service, which he also did himself, serving successively as private, sergeant, lieutenant, and captain, and finally as colonel of the regiment, which grew from this youthful company. Peter called his company the Guards, but it was known in Moscow as the Pleasure Company, or Troops for Sport. In time, however, it grew into the Preobrayensky Guards, a celebrated regiment which is still kept up as the first regiment of the Russian Imperial Guard and of which the emperor is always the colonel. Another company, formed on the same plan in an adjoining village, became the Semenovsky Regiment. From these rudiments grew the present Russian army. These military exercises soon ceased to be child's play to the active lad. He gave himself no rest from his prescribed duties, stood his watch in turn, shared in the labors of the camp, slept in the tents of his comrades, and partook of their fare. He used to lead his company on long marches, during which the strictest discipline was maintained, and the camps at night were guarded as in an enemy's country. On reaching his thirteenth year, the boy took further steps in his military education, building a small fortress, whose remains are still preserved. This was constructed with great care, and took nearly a year to build. At the suggestion of a German officer, it was named Pressburg, the name being given with much ceremony. Peter leading from Moscow a procession of most of the court officials and nobles to take part in the performance. These military sports were not enough for the active mind of the boy, who kept himself busy at a dozen labors. He used to hammer and forge in the blacksmith's shop, became an expert with the lathe, and learned the art of printing and binding books. He built himself a wheelbarrow and other articles which he needed, and at a later date it was said that he knew excellently well fourteen trades. When in Moscow, Peter spent much of his time in the foreign quarter, joining his associates there in the beer, wine, and tobacco of which they were especially fond, and questioning them about a thousand subjects unknown to the Russians, thus acquiring a wide knowledge of men and affairs. 
he troubled himself little about rank or position making a companion of any one high or low from whom anything could be learned while any mechanical curiosity particularly attracted him a sextant and astrolabe were brought him from france of whose use no one could inform him though he asked all whom he met at length a dutch merchant franz timmerman by name was brought to him who measured with the instrument the distance to a neighbouring house peter was delighted and eagerly asked to be taught how to use the instrument himself it is not so easy replied timmerman you must first learn arithmetic and geometry here was a new incentive the boy at once set to work spending all his leisure time day and night over these studies to which he afterwards added geography and fortification it was in this desultory way that his education was gained no regular course of training being prescribed and his strong self-will breaking through all family discipline we may end here what we have to say about the boy's military activity his army gradually grew until it numbered five thousand men mainly foreigners who were commanded by general gordon a scotch officer lefort a swiss who had been one of peter's favorite companions now undertook to raise an army of twelve thousand men he succeeded in this and unexpectedly found himself made general of this force it is however of the boy's activity in naval affairs that we must now speak timmerman had become one of his constant companions and was always teaching him something new one day in sixteen eighty eight when peter was sixteen years old he was wandering about one of the country estates of the throne near the village of ismailovo an old building in the flax yard attracted his attention and he asked one of the servants what it was it is a storehouse the man said in which was put all the rubbish that was left after the death of nikita romanov who used to live here peter at once curious to see this rubbish had the doors open went in and looked about in one corner bottom upward lay a boat very different in build from the flat bottom square stern boats which were in use on the russian rivers what is that he asked it is an english boat said timmerman but what is it good for is it better than our boats demanded peter yes if you had sails for it you would find that it would not only go with the wind but against the wind against the wind is that possible how can it be possible with his usual impatience the boy wanted to try it at once but the boat proved to be too rotten for use it would need to be repaired and tarred and a mast and sails would have to be made where could these be had who could make them timmerman was able to tell him some thirty years before a number of dutch ship carpenters had been brought from holland and had built some vessels on the volga river for the czar alexis these had been burned by a brigand and brant the builder had returned to moscow where he still worked as a joiner in those days it was easier to get into russia than to get out again foreigners who entered the land being held there as virtual prisoners even general gordon tried in vain to get back to his native land old brant was found looked over the boat put it in order and launched it on a neighboring stream to peter's surprise and delight he saw the boat moving under sail up and down the river turning to right and left in obedience to the helm greatly excited he called on brant to stop jumped in and after the old man's directions began to manage the boat himself but the river was too narrow and the water too shallow for easy sailing and the energetic boy had the boat dragged overland to a large pond where it went better but still not to his satisfaction where was a better body of water he was told that there was a large lake about fifty miles away but that it would be easier to build a new boat than to drag the english boat that distance can you do that asked the eager boy yes sire said brant but i will need many things oh that does not matter at all said peter we can have anything no time was lost brant with one of his old comrades and timmerman went to work at once in the woods bordering the lake peter working with them when he could get away from moscow where he was frequently needed it took time timber had to be prepared a hut built to live in and a dock to launch the boats which were built on a larger scale than the small english craft thus it was not until the following spring that the new boats were ready to launch peter meanwhile had been married but the charms of his wife could not keep him from his beloved boats back he went aided in completing and launching the new craft and took such delight in sailing them about the lake that he could hardly be induced to return to moscow for important duties in this humble way began the russian navy which had grown to large proportions before peter died 
the little english boat which some think was once sent by queen elizabeth to ivan the terrible has ever since peter's time been known as the grandsire of the russian navy it is kept with the greatest care in a small brick building within the fortress at st petersburg and was one of the principal objects of interest in the great parade in that city in eighteen seventy on the two hundredth anniversary of peter's birth it will suffice to say in conclusion that shortly after these events peter became the reigning czar and turned from sport to earnest sophia had enjoyed so long the pleasure of ruling that her ambition grew with its exercise and she sought to retain her position as long as possible it is even said that she laid a plot to assassinate peter so that only the feeble ivan should be left the boy told that the assassins were seeking him fled for his life his fright seems to have been groundless but it made him an undying enemy of his sister the affair ended in the bulk of the nobility and soldiery turning to his side and in sophia being obliged to leave the throne for a convent where she spent the remainder of her life in the misery of strict seclusion End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of historical tales volume eight russian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org historical tales volume eight russian by charles morris chapter sixteen carpenter peter of zandam on the banks of the river zon about five miles from amsterdam lies the picturesque little town of zandam with its cottages of blue green and pink half hidden among the trees while a multitude of windmills surround the town like so many monuments to thrift and enterprise here two centuries ago shipbuilding was conducted on a great scale the timber being sawed by windmill power while the workmen were so numerous that a vessel was often on the sea in five weeks after the keel had been laid to this place in august sixteen ninety seven came a workman of foreign birth who found humble quarters in a small frame hut and entered himself as a ship carpenter at the wharf of lindstroge there was nothing specially noticeable about the stranger who wore a workman's dress and a tarpaulin hat but with him were some comrades dressed in the strange garb of russia who attracted the attention of the people as for the new workman he did not long escape curious looks the rumor had got about that no less a personage than the czar of russia was in the town and it began to be suspected that this unobtrusive stranger might be the man so that it was not long before inquisitive eyes began to follow him wherever he went the rumor soon brought large crowds from amsterdam whose presence made the streets of the small dutch town anything but comfortable it was well known that peter the first czar of russia was traveling through the nations of the west a large embassy composed of several hundred people some of them the highest officials of the court had left the muscovite kingdom and visited the several courts and large cities on their route being everywhere received with the greatest distinction but the czar did not appear openly among them he was there in disguise but had given strict orders that his presence should not be revealed he hated crowds hated adulation and wished only to be let alone to see and learn all he could so while the ambassadors were receiving the highest honors of kingdoms and courts and bowing and parading to their hearts content the czar kept himself in the background as an amused spectator thought by most observers to be one of the servants of the gorgeous train and thus he reached zandam which he had been told was the best place to learn how ships were built here he saw fishing in the river one of his old acquaintances of the foreign quarter of moscow a smith named gerrit kist calling him from his rod and binding him to secrecy he told him why he had come to holland 
and insisted on taking up quarters in his house this house a small frame hut is now preserved as a sacred object enclosed within a brick building and has long been a place of pilgrimage even for royal travellers emperors and kings have bent their lofty heads to enter its low door yet peter lived in zandam only a week and during that week did little work at shipbuilding spending much of his time in rowing about among the shipping and visiting most of the factories and mills at one of which he made a sheet of paper with his own royal hands one day the disguised emperor met with an adventure he had bought a hat full of plums and was eating them in the most plebeian fashion as he walked along the street when he met a crowd of boys he shared his fruit with some of these but those to whom he refused to give plums began to follow him with boyish reviling and when he laughed at them they took to pelting him with mud and stones here was a situation for an emperor away from home the czar of all the russias had to take to his heels and run for refuge to the three swans inn where he sent for the burgomaster of the town told who he was and demanded aid and relief at least we may suppose so for an edict was soon issued threatening punishment to all who should insult quote, distinguished persons who wished to remain unknown end quote the end of peter's stay soon came a man in zandam had received a letter from his son in moscow saying that the czar was with the great russian embassy and describing him so closely that he could no longer remain unknown this letter was seen by pomp the barber of zandam and when peter came into his place with his russian comrades he at once knew him from the description and spread the news from that time the czar had no rest wherever he went he was followed by crowds of curious people they grew so annoying that at length he leaped in anger from his boat and gave one of the most forward of his persecutors a sharp cuff on the cheek bravo marsieur cried the crowd in delight you are made a knight the czar rushed angrily to an inn where he shut himself up out of sight the next day a large ship was to be moved across the dike by means of capstans and rollers a difficult operation in which peter took deep interest a place was reserved for him to see it but the crowd became so great as to drive back the guards break down the railings and half fill the reserved space peter seeing this refused to leave his house the burgomaster and other high officials begged him to come but the most he could be got to do was to thrust his head out of the door and observe the situation tivil vox tivil vox too many people he bluntly cried and refused to budge the next day was sunday and all amsterdam seemed to have come to zandam to see its distinguished guest he escaped them by fleeing to amsterdam getting to a yacht he had bought and to which he had fitted a bowsprit with his own hands he put to sea giving no heed to warnings of danger from the furious wind that was blowing three hours after he reached amsterdam where his ambassadors then were and where they were to have a formal reception the next day receptions were well enough for ambassadors but they were idle flummery to the czar who had come to see not to be seen and who did his best to keep out of sight he visited the fine town hall inspected the docks saw a comedy and a ballet consented to sit through a great dinner witnessed a splendid display of fireworks and most interesting to him of all was entertained with a great naval sham fight which lasted a whole day zandam has the credit of having been the scene of peter the great's labor as a shipwright but it was really at amsterdam that his life as a workman was passed at his request he was given the privilege of working at the docks of the east india company a house being assigned him within the enclosure 
where he could dwell undisturbed free from the curiosity of crowds as a mark of respect it was determined to begin the construction of a new frigate one hundred feet long so that the distinguished workmen might see the whole process of the building of a ship with his usual impetuosity peter wished to begin work immediately and could hardly be induced to wait for the fireworks to burn themselves out then he set out for zandam on his yacht to fetch his tools and the next day august thirty presented himself as a workman at the east india company's wharf for more than four months with occasional breaks peter worked diligently as a ship carpenter ten of his russian companions probably much against their will working at the wharf with him he was known simply as Bas peter carpenter peter and while sitting on a log at rest with his hatchet between his knees was willing to talk with any one who addressed him by this name but had no answer for those who called him sire or your majesty others of the russians were put to work elsewhere to study the construction of masts blocks sails etc some of them were entered as sailors before the mast and prince alexander of imericia went to the hague to study artillery none of them was allowed to take his ease at his inn peter insisted on being treated as a common workman and would not permit any difference to be made between him and his fellow laborers he also demanded the usual wages for his work on one occasion when the earl of portland and another nobleman came to the yard to have a sight of him the overseer to indicate him called out carpenter peter of zandam why don't you help your comrades without a word peter put his shoulders under a log which several men were carrying and helped to lift it to its place his evenings were spent in studying the theory of shipbuilding and his spare hours were fully occupied in observation he visited everything worth seeing factories museums cabinets of coins theatres hospitals etc constantly making shrewd remarks and inquiries and soon becoming known from his quick questions what is that for how does that work that will i see he went to zandam to see the greenland whaling fleet visited the celebrated botanical garden with the great borhav studied the microscope at delft under lewenhoek became intimate with the military engineer Cohorn, talked with schinwort of architecture and learned to etch from schonbeck an impression of a plate made by him of christianity victorious over islam is still extant he made himself familiar with dutch home life mingled with the merchants engaged in the russian trade went to the bottemmarkt every market day and took lessons from a travelling dentist experimenting on his own servants and suite probably not much to their enjoyment he mended his own clothes learned enough of cobbling to make himself a pair of slippers and in short was insatiable in his search for information of every available kind his work on the frigate whose keel he had helped to lay was continued until it was launched it was well built and for many years proved a good and useful ship braving the perils of the seas in the east india trade but with all this the imperial carpenter was not satisfied the dutch methods did not please him the shipmasters seemed to work without rules other than the rule of thumb having no theory of shipbuilding from which the best proportions of a vessel could be deduced learning that things were ordered differently in english shipyards that there work was done by rule and precept peter sent an order to the russian docks not to allow the dutch shipwrights to work as they pleased but to put them under danish or english overseers for himself he resolved to go to england and follow up his studies there king william had sent him a warm invitation and presented him a splendid yacht light 
beautifully proportioned and armed with twenty brass cannon delighted with the present he sailed in it to england escorted by an english fleet and in london found an abiding place in a house which a few years before had been the refuge of william penn when charged with treason here he slept in a small room with four or five companions and when the king of england came to visit him received his fellow monarch in his shirt-sleeves the air of the room was so bad that though the weather was very cold william insisted on a window being raised in england the czar though managing to see much outside the shipyards worked steadily at deptford for several months leaving only when he had gained all the special knowledge which he could obtain his admiration for the english shipbuilders was high he afterwards saying that but for his journey to england he would have always remained a bungler while here he engaged many men to take service in russia shipwrights engineers and others he also engaged numerous officers for his navy from holland several french surgeons and various persons of other nationality the whole numbering from six to eight hundred skilled artisans and professional experts to raise money for their advance payment he sold the monopoly of the russian tobacco trade for twenty thousand pounds sixty years before his grandfather michael had forbidden the use of tobacco in russia under pain of death and the prejudice against it was still strong but in spite of this the use of tobacco was rapidly spreading and peter thus threw down the bars great numbers of anecdotes are afloat about peter's doings in holland and england many of them doubtless invented the sight of a great monarch going about in workmen's clothes and laboring like a common ship carpenter was apt to aid the imagination of story-tellers and give rise to numerous tales with little fact to sustain them in may sixteen ninety eight peter left england and proceeded to amsterdam where his embassy had remained often in great distress about him for the winter was cold and stormy and at one time no news was received from him for a month from amsterdam he made his way to vienna whence he proposed to go to venice and rome but was prevented by disturbing news from moscow which turned his steps homeward here he was to show a new phase of his varied character as will be seen in the following tale end of chapter sixteen Recording by Linda Johnson Chapter 17 of Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian by charles morris chapter seventeen the fall of the strelitz history presents us with four instances of an imperial soldiery who took the power into their own hands and for a time ruled as the tyrants of a nation these were the praetorian guards of rome the mamelukes of egypt the janissaries of turkey and the strelitz of russia of these the praetorian guards remained preeminent and made emperors at their will the other three came to a terrible end history elsewhere records the tragic fate of the mamelukes and the janissaries we are here concerned only with that of the strelitz corps of russia the strelitz were the first regular military force of russia a permanent militia of fusiliers formed during the early reign of ivan the terrible and themselves in time becoming a terror to the nation the first serious outbreak of this dangerous civic guard was on the nomination of peter i to the throne of the czar they did not dream then of the terrible revenge which this despised boy would take upon them <laughs> 
two days after the funeral of the Tsar Theodore, the insurrection began. The strelits marching in an armed body to the Kremlin, where they accused nine of their colonels of defrauding them of their pay. The frightened ministers hastened to dismiss these officers, but this did not satisfy the savage soldiery, who insisted on their being delivered into their hands. This done, the unfortunate officers were sentenced to be scourged, some of them by that fearful Russian whip called the Newt. Their success in this outbreak led the Strelitz to greater outrages. The tiger in their savage natures was let loose, and only blood could appease its rage. Marching to the Kremlin, they declared that the late Tsar had been poisoned by his doctor, and demanded the death of all those in the plot. Breaking into the palace, they seized two of the suspected princes and flung them from the windows, to be received upon the pikes of the soldiers in the street below. The next victim was one of the Narishkins, the uncles of Peter the Great. He was massacred in the same brutal manner, and his bleeding body dragged through the streets. Three of the proscribed nobles had fled for sanctuary to a church, but were torn from the altar, stripped of their clothing, and cut to pieces with knives. The next victim was a friend and favorite of the Strelitz, who was killed under the belief that he was one of the Narishkins. Discovering their error, the assassins carried the mangled body of the young nobleman to the house of his father for interment. The old man, timid by nature, did not dare to complain of the savage act, and even rewarded them for bringing him the body of his son. For this weakness he was bitterly reproached by his wife and daughters, and the weeping wife of the victim. "'What could I do?' pleaded the helpless father. "'Let us wait for an opportunity to be revenged.' A revengeful servant overheard these words, and repeated them to the soldiers. In a sudden fury the savages returned, dragged the old man from the room by the hair of his head, and cut his throat at his own door. Meanwhile, some of the Strelitz, seeking the Dutch physician Vongad, who had attended the dying Tsar, and was accused of poisoning him, met his son and asked where his father was. "'I do not know,' replied the trembling youth. His ignorance was instantly punished with death. In a few minutes, a German physician fell in their way, you are a doctor they cried if you have not poisoned our master theodore you have poisoned others you deserve death and in a moment the unlucky doctor fell a victim to their blind rage the dutch physician was at length discovered and dragged to the palace here the princesses begged hard for his life declaring that he was a skilful doctor and a good man and had worked hard to save their brother's life they answered that he deserved to die as a sorcerer as well as a physician for they had found the skeleton of a toad and the skin of a snake in his cabinet the next victim demanded was ivan narishkin who they were sure was somewhere concealed in the palace not finding him they threatened to burn down the building unless he were delivered into their hands. At this terrifying threat, the young man was taken from his place of concealment and brought to them by the patriarch, who held in his hands an image of the Virgin Mary, which was said to have performed miracles. The princesses surrounded the victim, and, kneeling to the soldiers, prayed with tears for his life all their supplications and the demands of the venerable patriarch were without effect on the savage soldiery who dragged their captives to the bottom of the stairway went through the forms of a mock trial and condemned them to the torture they were sentenced to be cut to pieces a form of punishment to which parricides are condemned in china and tartary this tragedy went on until all the proscribed on whom they could lay their hands had perished, and Sophia felt secure in her power.
in the end ivan and peter were declared joint sovereigns 1682 and their sister sophia was made regent the acts of the strelitz were approved and they rewarded the estates of their victims were confiscated in their favor and a monument was erected on which the names of the victims were inscribed as traitors to their country the strelitz had learned their power and took frequent occasion to exercise it twice again they broke out in revolt during the regency of sophia after the accession of peter their hostility continued he had sent them to fight on the frontiers he had supplanted them with regiments drilled in the european manner he had organized a corps of twelve thousand foreigners and heretics he had ordered the construction of a fleet of a hundred vessels which would add to the weight of taxes and bring more foreigners into the country and he proposed to leave russia to journey in the lands of the heretics and to bring back to their sacred land the customs of profane europe all this was too much for the leaders of the strelitz who represented old russia as peter represented new they resolved to sacrifice the czar to their rage tradition tells the following story which though probably not true is at least interesting two leaders of the strelitz laid a plot to start a fire at night feeling sure that peter with his usual activity would hasten to the scene in the confusion attending the fire they meant to murder him and then to massacre all the foreigners whom he had introduced into moscow the time fixed for the consummation of this plot was at hand a banquet was held at which the principal conspirators assembled and where they sought in deep potations the courage necessary for their murderous work unfortunately for them liquor does not act on all alike while usually giving boldness it sometimes produces timidity two of the villains lost their courage through their potations left the room on some pretext promising to return in time and hastened to the czar with the story of the plot peter knew not the meaning of the words timidity and procrastination his plans were instantly laid the time fixed for the conflagration was midnight he gave orders that the hall in which the conspirators were assembled should be surrounded exactly at eleven soon after thinking that the hour had come he sought the place alone and boldly entered the room fully expecting to find the conspirators in the hands of his guards to his consternation not a guard was present and he found himself alone and unarmed in the midst of a furious band who were just swearing to compass his destruction the situation was a critical one the conspirators dismayed at this unlooked-for visit rose in confusion peter was furious at his guards for having exposed him to this peril but instantly perceived that there was only one course for him to pursue he advanced among the throng of traitors with a countenance that showed no trace of his emotions and pleasantly remarked i saw the light in your house while passing and thinking that you must be having a gay time together i have come in to share your pleasure and drain a cup with you then seating himself at the table he filled a cup and drank to his would-be assassins who on their feet about him could not avoid responding to the toast and drinking his health but this state of affairs did not long continue the courage of the conspirators returned and they began to exchange looks and signs the opportunity had fallen into their hands now was the time to avail themselves of it one of them leaned over to sukhanim one of their leaders and said in a low tone brother it is time not yet said sukhanim hesitating at the critical moment at that instant peter heard the footsteps of his guards outside and starting to his feet knocked the leader of the assassins down by a violent blow in his face exclaiming 
if it is not yet time for you scoundrel it is for me at the same moment the guards entered the room and the conspirators panic-stricken by the sight fell on their knees and begged for pardon chain them said the czar in a terrible voice turning then to the commander of the guards he struck him and accused him of having disobeyed orders but the officer proving to him that the hour fixed had just arrived the czar in sudden remorse at his haste clasped him in his arms kissed him on the forehead proclaimed his fidelity and gave the traitors into his charge and now peter showed the savage which lay within him under the thin veneer of civilization the conspirators were put to death with the cruelest of tortures and to complete the act of barbarity their heads were exposed on the summit of a column with their limbs arranged around them as ornaments satisfied that this fearful example would keep russia tranquil during his absence peter set out on his journey visiting most of the countries of western europe he had reached vienna and was on the point of setting out for venice when word was brought him from russia that the strelitz had broken out in open insurrection and were marching from their posts on the frontier upon moscow the czar at once left vienna and journeyed with all possible speed to russia reaching moscow in september sixteen ninety eight his appearance took all by surprise for none knew that he had yet left austria he came too late to suppress the insurrection that had been already done by general gordon who marching in all haste had met the rebels about thirty miles from moscow and called on them to surrender as they refused and attacked the troops he opened on them with cannon put them to flight and of the survivors took captive about two thousand these were decimated on the spot and the remainder imprisoned this was punishment enough for a soldier but not enough for an autocrat whose mind was haunted by dark suspicions and who looked upon the outbreak as a plot to dethrone him and to call his sister sophia to the throne in his treatment of the prisoners the spirit of the monster ivan the fourth seems to have entered into his soul and the cruelty shown while common enough in old-time russia is revolting to the modern mind the trial was dragged out through six weeks with daily torture of some of the accused under the eyes of the czar himself who sought to force from them a confession that sophia had been concerned in the outbreak the wives of the prisoners all the women servants of the princesses even poor beggars who lived on their charity were examined under torture the princesses themselves peter's sisters were questioned by the czar though he did not go so far as to torture them yet with all this nothing was discovered there was not a word to connect sophia with the revolt the trial over the executions began of the prisoners some were hanged some beheaded others broken on the wheel it is said that those beheaded were made to kneel in rows of fifty before trunks of trees laid on the ground and that peter compelled his courtiers and nobles to act as executioners menchikoff specially distinguishing himself in this work of slaughter it is even asserted that the czar wielded the axe himself though of this there is some doubt the opinion grew among the people that neither peter nor prince ramodanovsky his cruel viceroy could sleep until they had tasted blood and a letter from the prince contains the following lurid sentence i am always washing myself in blood the headless bodies of the dead were left where they had fallen the long russian winter was just beginning and for five months they lay unburied a frightful spectacle for the eyes of the citizens of moscow of those hanged nearly two hundred were left depending from a large square gallows in front of the cell of sophia 
at the convent in which she was confined and with a horrible refinement of cruelty three of these bodies were so placed as to hang all winter under her very window one of them holding in his hand a folded paper to represent a petition for her aid the six regiments of strelitz still on the frontier showed signs of a similar outbreak but the news of the executions taught them that it was safest to keep quiet but many of them were brought in chains to moscow and punished for their intentions various stories are told of peter's cruelty in connection with these executions one is that he beheaded eighty with his own hand pleschev one of his boyars holding them by the hair another story told by m prince the prussian ambassador says that at an entertainment given him by the czar peter when drunk had twenty rebels brought in from the prisons whom he beheaded in quick succession drinking a bumper after each blow the whole concluding within the hour he even asked the ambassador to try his skill in the same way it may be said here however that these stories rest upon very poor evidence and that anecdote makers have painted peter in blacker colors than he deserves in the end the corps of the strelitz was abolished their houses and lands in moscow were taken from the survivors and all were exiled into the country where they became simple villagers end of chapter seventeen recording by linda johnson chapter eighteen of historical tales volume eight russian this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris. Chapter 18. The Crusade Against Beards and Cloaks. The return of Peter the Great from his European journey was marked by other events than his cruel revenge upon the rebellious Strelitz. That had affected only a few thousand people, the reforms he sought to introduce affected the nation at large the russians were then more oriental than european in style wearing the long kaftan or robe of persia and turkey which descended to their heels while their beards were like those of the patriarchs the man deeming himself most in honour who had the longest and fullest crop of hair upon his face to peter fresh from the west and strongly imbued with european views all this was ridiculous if not abominable he determined to reform it all and at once set to work in his impetuous way which could not brook a day's delay to deprive the russians of their beards and the tails of their coats he had scarcely arrived before the boyars and leading citizens of moscow who flocked to congratulate him on his return were taken aback by the edict that whiskers were condemned and that the razor must be set at work without delay upon their honourable chins this edict was like a thunderclap from a clear sky the russians admired and revered their beards they were time honoured and sacred in their eyes to lose them was like losing their family trees and patents of nobility but peter was without reverence for the past and his word was law he had ordered a mowing and reaping of hair and the harvest must be made or worse might come general sheen commander-in-chief of the army was the first to yield to the imperative edict and submit his venerable beard to the indignity of the razor's edge the old age seemed past and the new age come when sheen walked shamefacedly into court with a clean chin the example thus set was quickly followed beards were tabooed within the precincts of the court all shared the same fate none being left to laugh at the rest the patriarch it is true was exempted through awe for his high office in the church while reverence for advanced years reprieved prince Cherkassy, and tikhon stresnev was excused out of honour for his services as guardian of the tsaritsa everyone else within the court had to submit to the razor's fatal edge or feel the tsar's more fatal displeasure and beards fell like autumnal leaves that strow the brooks in valombrosa an observer speaks as follows concerning a feast given by general sheen a crowd of boyars scribes and military officers almost incredible was assembled there 
and among them were several common sailors with whom the czar repeatedly mixed divided apples and even honored one of them by calling him his brother a salvo of twenty-five guns marked each toast nor could the irksome offices of the barber check the festivities of the day though it was well known he was enacting the part of jester by appointment at the czar's court it was of evil omen to make show of reluctance as the razor approached the chin and hesitation was to be forthwith punished with a box on the ears in this way between mirth and the wine cup many were admonished by this insane ridicule to abandon the olden guise for peter to shave was easy as he had little beard and a very thin moustache but by the old-fashioned russian of his day the beard was cherished as the turk now cherishes his hirsute symbol of dignity or the chinaman his long drawn-out cue shortly after peter came to the throne the patriarch adrian had delivered himself in words of thunder against all who were so unholy and heretical as to cut or shave their beards a god-given ornament which had been worn by prophets and apostles and by christ himself only heretics apostates idol worshippers and image breakers among monarchs had forced their subjects to shave he declared while all the great and good emperors had indicated their piety in the length of their beards to peter on the contrary the beard was the symbol of barbarity he was not content to say that his subjects might shave he decreed that they must shave it began half in jest it was continued in solid earnest he could not well execute the non-shavers or cut off the heads of those who declined to cut off their beards but he could find them and he did the order was sent forth that all russians with the exception of the clergy should shave those who preferred to keep their beards could do so by paying a yearly tax into the public treasury this was fixed at a kopeck one penny for peasants but for the higher classes varied from thirty to a hundred roubles from sixty dollars to two hundred dollars the merchants being at once the richest and most conservative class paid the highest tax every one who paid the tax was given a bronze token which had to be worn about the neck and renewed every year the czar would allow no one to be about him who did not shave and many submitted through terror of having their beards in a merry humour pulled out by the roots or taken so rough off that some of the skin went with them many of those who shaved continued to do reverence to their beards by carrying them within their bosoms as sacred objects to be buried in their graves in order that a just account might be rendered to st nicholas when they should come to the next world the ukase against the beard was soon followed by one against the kaftan or long cloak the old russian dress the czar and the leading officers of his embassy set the example of wearing the german dress and he cut off with his own hands the long sleeves of some of his officers those things are in your way he would say you are safe nowhere with them at one moment you upset a glass then you forgetfully dip them in the sauce get gaiters made of them on january fourteenth seventeen hundred a decree was issued commanding all courtiers and officials throughout the empire to wear the foreign dress this decree had to be frequently repeated and models of the clothing exposed it is said that patterns of the garments and copies of the decrees were hung up together at the gates of the towns while all who disobeyed the order were compelled to pay a fine those who yielded were obliged to kneel down at the gates of the city and have their coats cut off just even with the ground the part that lay on the ground as they kneeled being condemned to suffer by the shears being done with a good humour it occasioned mirth among the people and soon broke the custom of their wearing long coats especially in places near moscow and those towns wherever the czar came this demand did not apply to the peasantry and was therefore more easily executed even the women were required to change their russian robes for foreign fashions peter's sisters set the example which was quickly followed the women showing themselves much less conservative than the men in the adoption of new styles of dress the reform did not end here decrees were issued against the high roman boots against the use of the russian saddle and even against the long russian knife peter seemed to be infected with a passion for reform and almost everything russian was ordered to give way before the influx of western modes western ideas did not come with them to change the dress does not change the thoughts and it does not civilize a man to shave his chin 
though outwardly conforming to the advanced fashions of the west inwardly the russians continued to conform to the unprogressive conceptions of the east it may be said that these changes did not come to stay they were too revolutionary to take deep root there is no disputing the fact that a coat down to the heels is more comfortable in a cold climate than one ending at the knees and is likely to be worn in preference students in russia today wear the red shirt the loose trousers tucked into the high boots and the sleeveless caftan of the peasant to show that they are slavs in feeling while the old russian costume is the regulation court dress for ladies on occasions of state we cannot here name the host of other reforms which peter introduced the army was dressed and organized in the fashion of the west a navy was rapidly built and before many years russia was winning victories at sea peter had not worked at amsterdam and deptford in vain the money of the country was reorganized and new coins were issued the year which had always begun in russia on september first was now ordered to begin on january first the first new year on the new system january first seventeen hundred being introduced with impressive ceremonies up to this time the russians had counted their year from the supposed date of creation they were now ordered to date their chronology from the birth of christ the first year of the new era being dated seventeen hundred instead of seventy two o eight unluckily the gregorian calendar was not at the same time introduced and russia still clings to the old style so that each date in that country is twelve days behind the same date in the rest of the christian world another reform of an important character was introduced peter had observed the system of local self-government in other countries and resolved to have something like it in his realm in little russia the people already had the right of electing their local officials a similar system was extended to the whole empire the merchants in the towns being permitted to choose good and honest men who formed a council which had general charge of municipal affairs where bribery and corruption were discovered among these officials the knout and exile were applied as inducements to honesty in office even death was threatened yet bribery went on honesty in office cannot be made to order even by a czar End of chapter 18。Chapter 19 of Tales, Volume 8, Russian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris. Mazepa the cossack chief among the romantic characters of history none have attained higher celebrity than the hero of our present tale whose remarkable adventure often told in story has been made immortal in lord byron's famous poem of mazeppa those who wish to read it in all its dramatic intensity must apply to the poem here it can only be given in plain prose Mazeppa was a scion of a poor but noble Polish family, and became, while quite young, a page at the court of John Casimir, King of Poland. There he remained until he reached manhood, when he returned to the vicinity of his birth. And now occurred the striking event on which the fame of our hero rests. The court-reared young man is said to have engaged in an intrigue with a Polish lady of high rank, or at least was suspected by her jealous husband of having injured him in his honour. Bent upon a revenge suitable to the barbarous ideas of that age, the furious nobleman had the young man seized, cruelly scourged, and in the end stripped naked and firmly bound upon the back of an untamed horse of the steppes. The wild animal, terrified by the strange burden upon its back, was then set free on the borders of its native wilds of the Ukraine, and, uncontrolled by bit or rain, galloped madly for miles upon miles, through forest and over plain, until, exhausted by the violence of its flight, it halted in its wild career. For a dramatic rendering of this frightful ride, our readers must be referred to Byron's glowing verse. <laughs> 
the savage polish lord had not dreamed that his victim would escape alive but fortune favored the poor youth he was found still fettered to the animal's back insensible and half dead by some cossack peasants who rescued him from his fearful situation took him to their hut and eventually restored him to animation mazeppa was well educated and fully versed in the art of war of that day he made his home with his new friends to whom his courage agility and sagacity proved such warm recommendations that he soon became highly popular among the cossack clans he was appointed secretary and adjutant to samoylovich the hetman or chief of the cossacks and on the disgrace and exile of this chief in 1687, Mazepa succeeded him as leader of the tribe. He distinguished himself particularly in the war waged by the army of the Princess Sophia against the Turks and Tatars of the Crimea, in which Mazepa led his Cossack followers with the greatest courage and skill. On the return of the army to Moscow, Prince Galitsyn, its leader, brought into the capital a strong force of Cossacks, with Mazepa at their head. It was the first time the Cossacks had been allowed to enter Moscow, and their presence gave great offence. It was supposed to be a part of the plot of Sophia to dethrone her young brother and seize the throne for herself. It was known that they would execute to the full any orders given them by their chief, but their motions were so restricted by the indignant people that the ambitious woman, if she entertained such a design, found herself unable to employ them in it. The daring hetman of the Cossacks became afterwards a cherished friend of Peter the Great, who conferred on him the title of prince, and severely punished those who accused him of conspiring with the enemies of Russia. Having the fullest confidence in his good faith, Peter banished or executed his foes as liars and traitors. Yet they seem to have been the true men, and Mazeppa the traitor, for at length, when sixty-four years of age, he threw off allegiance to Russia and became an ally of the Swedish enemies of the realm. The fiery and ungovernable temper of Peter is said to have been the cause of this. The story goes that one day when Mazeppa was visiting the Russian court and was at table with the Tsar, Peter complained to him of the lawless character of the Cossacks and proposed that Mazeppa should seek to bring them under better control by a system of organization and discipline. The chief replied that such measures would never succeed. The Cossacks were so fierce and uncontrollable by nature, he said, and so fixed in their irregular habits of warfare that it would be impossible to get them to submit to military discipline and they must continue to fight in their old wild way these words were like fire to flax peter who never could bear the least opposition to any of his plans or projects and was accustomed to have everybody timidly agree with him broke into a furious rage at this contradiction and visited his sudden wrath on mazeppa as usual in the most violent language he was an enemy and a traitor who deserved to be and should be impaled alive roared the furious tsar not meaning a tithe of what he said but saying enough to turn the high-spirited chief from a friend to a foe mazeppa left the tsar's presence in deep offence muttering the displeasure which it would have been death to speak openly and bent on revenge soon after he entered into communication with charles the twelfth of sweden the bitter enemy of russia which he was then invading he suggested that the Swedish army should advance into southern Russia, where the Cossacks would be sure to be sent to meet it. He would then go over with all his forces to the Swedish side, so strengthening it that the army of the Tsar should not stand against it. The king of Sweden might retain the territory won by his arms, while the Cossacks would retire to their own land and become again, as of old, an independent tribe. 
the plot was well laid but it failed through the loyalty of the cossacks they broke into wild indignation when mazeppa unfolded to them his plan most of them refusing to join in the revolt and threatening to seize him and deliver him bound hand and foot to the tsar some two thousand in all adhered to mazeppa and for a time it seemed as if a bloody battle would take place between the two sections of the tribe but in the end the chief and his followers made their way to the swedish camp while the others marched back and put themselves under the command of the nearest russian general mazeppa was now sentenced to death and executed luckily for him in effigy only in person he was out of the reach of his foes a wooden image was made to represent the culprit and on this dumb block the penalties prescribed for him were inflicted a pretty play for a savage horde they made of it the image was dressed to imitate mazeppa while representations of the medals ribbons and other decorations he usually wore were placed upon it it was then brought out before the general and leading officers the soldiers being drawn up in a square around it a herald now read the sentence of condemnation and the mock execution began first mazeppa's patent of knighthood was torn to pieces and the fragments flung into the air then the medals and the decorations were rent from the image and trampled underfoot finally the image itself was struck a blow that toppled it over into the dust the hangman now took it in hand tied a rope round its neck and dragged it to a gibbet on which it was hung the affair ended in the cossacks choosing a new chief the remainder of mazeppa's story may soon be told the battle of poltava fought it is said by his advice ended the military career of the great swedish general the cossack chief made his escape with the king of sweden into turkish territory and the reward which the tsar offered for his body dead or alive was never claimed menshikov took what revenge he could by capturing and sacking his capital city baturin while throughout russia his name was anathematized from the pulpit traitor in his old days and a fugitive in a foreign land the disgrace of his action seemed to weigh heavily upon the mind of the old chief of the ukraine and in the following year he put an end to the wretchedness of his life by poison end of chapter nineteen